Continuous enemy attacks over the next 40 minutes, delivered by three separate American formations. The first was a group of 16 dive bombers, under Major Lofton R. Henderson, that were approaching Kido Butai from the southeast. His Marine pilots, members of Marine Scout Bombing Squadron 241, had taken off just after Midway's B-26s and torpedo bomber fighters. However, owing to the slower cruising speed of his Scout Bomber Douglases, as well as having taken a more northerly course, they had been later in spotting the Japanese force. Henderson's men were some of the rawest flyers on the American side of the battle. Most of them had never flown a Scout Bomber Douglas until a few days previously, and more than half had only been with the unit for a few days. In their commander's opinion, his unit did not yet have the skills needed to execute a true dive-bombing attack. Instead, Henderson led his flight in from an altitude of 9,500 feet, hoping to survive long enough to execute a shallower glide-bombing attack against the two flattops he saw on the port side of the Japanese formation, the wildly manoeuvring carriers of Carrier Division 2. Henderson's men had just started their gradual descent toward the target when the Zeros hit them. The Japanese combat air patrol fighters tore into Henderson's formation with merciless precision. Akagi's Lieutenant Ibusuki and his two remaining 6th coup pilots were joined by Hiryu's 3rd patrol, a pair of Zeros led by Warrant Officer Kodama Yoshimi, as well as Soryu's 3rd patrol Shotai, under the redoubtable Lieutenant Fujita. This was, in fact, the entirety of the Japanese combat air patrol, as Kaga's four remaining fighters were already lining up for recovery. Nine fighters weren't much with which to tackle a full squadron of enemy dive bombers, but in the event they proved deadly effective. Six United States aircraft went flaming down into the ocean almost at once. Major Henderson was one of the first, trying to hold his plane and his formation steady until the end. Henderson's death would lead to his name being used for a captured airfield on Guadalcanal, which would earn one of the most glorious names in American military history. However, there was nothing glorious about the predicament his surviving men found themselves in. They had little choice but to hold formation and continuing boring in toward the target, firing back as best they could. Somehow in the process, the American radio gunners managed to send Hiryu's Kodama to his demise. Finally, Henderson's wingman, Captain Richard E. Fleming, led the shredded squadron into their glide-bombing attacks. Below them, Gunnery Lieutenant Nagayasu on Hiryu again ordered his batteries into action, adding to the general noise and confusion and making the American attack runs all the more difficult. They were coming in from all sides now, their formation shattered. The 25mm mounts that lined Hiryu's flight deck spat out strands of incongruously pretty tracer shells. To the Japanese watching from Akagi, it was obvious that the Americans were poorly trained. No self-respecting dive-bomber pilot would have attempted to bag a carrier with such an anemic attack. Glide-bombing was the worst of both worlds. It eschewed the slender advantage of hugging the deck, while accruing neither of the twin benefits gained from a high-angle attack accuracy and near invulnerability to return fire. Yet, the results of the American attack were spectacular if utterly ineffective. Despite the hell they had just come through, Fleming's men managed to bracket Hiryu with numerous near misses between 8.08am and 8.12am, some as close as 50 metres from the ship. These bombs raised such water spouts that Yamaguchi's flagship was momentarily hidden from the eyes of the rest of the fleet. Nagayasu and his men in the gun tubs were drenched with seawater. Yet in the end, here you emerged unscathed from the grey-white plumes that had erupted around her. Once again, the Americans had paid prohibitively for no result, and the Japanese combat air patrol thereupon hounded the surviving scout bomber Douglases out of the area. One portion of this rather sorry episode has been overlooked, namely, that even against poorly trained American pilots attacking in a highly vulnerable fashion. Hiryu's anti-aircraft failed to account for a single enemy aircraft that we know of, despite Nagayasu's own belief that his very fierce fire had been responsible for the Americans' poor aim. Hiryu should have been able to bring a half-dozen 5-inch and a dozen or so 25mm barrels to bear on almost any broadside bearing. This was hardly an insignificant amount of firepower, yet she apparently hit nothing. Indeed, 
American strafing killed more of her crewmen than she claimed in return. If this was how Japanese anti-aircraft performed against opponents who were hardly the varsity, it did not bode well if the Americans' A-team should suddenly appear. Yet for all the Japanese knew, this was the enemy's best. They had seen three different American attacks thus far, the last of which had been flown by carrier-type aircraft, although the Japanese did not know that Henderson's squadron was land-based. Yet in each case, the performance of the Americans had been subpar. They were clearly brave, but they had come in dumb, unescorted, and attacking poorly. If these were the same calibre of pilots who had managed to send Shokaku limping back to the yard, then Carrier Division 5's lowly status within Kido Butai was well deserved. However, almost simultaneously with Henderson's gallant but futile effort, another American attack began materialising. At 7.45am, Japanese lookouts spotted aircraft at high altitude, which quickly revealed themselves to be a dozen four-engine American bombers. This was the B-17 force of Lieutenant Colonel Walter C. Sweeney, which had been sent aloft at 4.30am to attack Tanaka's transports, only to be redirected north by Midway as soon as the Japanese carriers had been detected. They were very high up, over 20,000 feet. The Zeros were going to have a devil of a time reaching them all the way up there. Not only that, but the entirety of the combat air patrol was already engaged in repulsing Henderson's attack in any case. The bombers split into three groups and went after Akagi, Soryu and Hiryu in an almost leisurely fashion. The Japanese began banging away with their heavy anti-aircraft guns, but the Americans were never in any great danger. Having attacked Tanaka's invasion forces the previous day from medium altitudes, Sweeney's men, upon further reflection, had judged their approach rather too low. This morning, against more heavily armed warships complete with fighter cover, they had decided to stay higher up. It was a sound decision, as the Japanese anti-aircraft fire was none too good. The Americans noted that the Japanese shells seemed to be fused to detonate at the right altitude, but consistently exploded well behind them. Altitude, however, worked both ways. Down below, the Japanese captains watched as the bombers came into their runs. Coolly, they waited until each element had dropped, then put the helm over into radical evasive manoeuvres. Whether the Americans dropped promptly or even on target was largely irrelevant. The pirouetting warships below still had a good 30 seconds worth of airtime to play with, meaning that they could be a quarter of a mile in nearly any direction when the bombs finally landed. Even by dropping a stick of a dozen or more 500 LB weapons at a time, the odds of securing a hit weren't good. Not only that, but the cloud cover over Kido Butai frustrated several of their attacks, forcing some aircraft to make numerous runs before finally dropping, yet the Americans almost got lucky. In the course of the 20-minute long series of runs, both Hiryu and Soryu were bracketed by near misses, to the consternation of the Japanese. In the end, though, the American heavies scored no damage. In the midst of all this mayhem, at 7.58 a.m., Tone No. 4 sent a message apprising Nagumo that the enemy task force had changed course to 080. Nagumo sent a terse communique back. Advise ship types. Course information was not what was required at this point. He needed the enemy force's composition as quickly as possible. It seems almost certain that Nagumo signalled to Soryu around this time to make her special reconnaissance aircraft ready for launch. This was a perfect mission for the new D-4Y, where its great speed could hopefully make up for some of the forces lost time. Given that both Henderson's and the B-17 attacks were getting underway by 8am, the men of Akagi had been somewhat incredulous to observe Kaga holding her course into the wind long enough to bring on board the last of her four combat air patrol fighters. Kido Butai was vulnerable, with only nine fighters overhead, not surprisingly. Akagi had already been warming up a replacement shotai. Kaga, as soon as she had recovered her foursome, immediately spotted another seven for warm-up and launch, even as the B-17s droned away overhead. In fact, intermittent combat air patrol launches from all the carriers would punctuate the breaks in the action clearly. Each carrier's captain was feeling the need to augment the combat air patrol. Whether they were operating independently or under orders from the flagship, we cannot know. 
but the net effect was that the flight decks were in near constant use by small groups of aircraft at this time. Such was the spectacle that Tomonaga and his returning force beheld when Kido Butai heaved into view at about 8.05 a.m. On the northern horizon ahead of them, their carriers bobbed and weaved beneath the American heavy bombers. Hiryu described a series of S-shaped manoeuvres as sticks of bombs landed on either side. Soryu was resorting to the simple expedient of putting the helm hard over to starboard and carving an enormous doughnut in the ocean. Seeing the retreating American scout bomber Douglases from Henderson's savaged flight coming toward them on the deck, one of Tomonaga's Akagi Zeros took this opportunity to join the combat air patrol. He was joined by six of Kaga's Kanbaku as well. The Type 99 was a manoeuvrable airplane once it had shed its bomb, and some of Carrier Division 1's drivers may have judged that they could take on their opposite numbers in the apparent absence of any American fighters. At the same time, seeing their mother ship under heavy attack, all nine of Soryu's strike fighters pitched into steep climbs to engage the B-17s overhead. For his part, Tomonaga and the rest of the Kanko and Kanbaku simply eased down to 400 metres and circled at a distance, waiting to commence landing. Until the American attacks cleared up, the carriers below had no ability to take their aircraft on board. Waiting with them was Warrant Officer Yoshino Haruo, the recon flight leader from Kaga. Yoshino, who had joined the Navy because all the marching in the army seemed like way too much work, took a while to find Kaga amidst the chaos the fleet was all spread out as a result of the attack. When he did find her, Kaga's flight deck was already closed for business and not receiving aircraft. Instead, Yoshino loitered nearby with Kaga's Kanbaku, Akagi had turned into the wind briefly at 8.8am to launch a flight of three fighters under Warrant Officer Ono Zenji. Kaga followed suit at 8.15am, sending up a group of five zeros under En's Yamaguchi Hiroyuki. Given the threat of attack, the carriers weren't bothering holding a steady course into the wind for their launches. They were simply bringing their bows momentarily close enough to it that the zeros could dash down the deck and into the air. Between these two launches and the fortuitous addition of the returning strike fighters, Kido Butai was now finally beginning to put sufficient air cover up to beat off the ongoing American attacks. However, the B-17s overhead proved to be tough customers. Kaga's Yamaguchi immediately took two of his wingmen up in pursuit of them, joining Soryu's Zeros. However, the attacks by both groups of fighters were desultory at best, they managed to damage a few of the flying forts, but none seriously. Lieutenant Colonel Sweeney's pithy summation afterward was that their heart was not in their work. This was probably simply confirmation of what everybody in the force below already knew the Zero was no great shakes at high-altitude combat. Not only that, but after four hours in the air, Soryu's fighters were almost at the end of their tether in terms of fuel and ammunition. At 8.11am, just as Hiryu was being bracketed by Henderson's attack, Tone No. 4 signalled back to Nagumo that the enemy is composed of five cruisers and five destroyers. On Akagi's bridge, a momentary sense of relief washed over Nagumo's staff. Perhaps there was not as much to worry about as had previously been feared. If the Americans had only surface ships and no carriers, then they were well outside the range where Kido Butai needed to worry about them for the moment. The critical question of why the enemy would be where he was without having carriers was apparently not explicitly asked, although Kusaka remembered in retrospect that he was still suspicious. One message alone, in his opinion, couldn't make it clear that no enemy carriers were there. Nor could there be an enemy force without carriers in the reported area under the prevailing circumstances. Sure enough, ten minutes later, at about 8.20 a.m., a third message from Tone No. 4 came back to Akagi that permanently dispelled Nagumo's temporary sense of security. The enemy is accompanied by what appears to be a carrier. Nagumo's exact reaction has not been recorded, but there couldn't help but have been great consternation on Akagi's bridge. Now, beyond all doubt, the Admiral and his staff knew that their original battle plan was out the window. The American Navy was present in force, Destroying the enemy flight deck was absolutely the highest priority at hand. A justifiable question at this point would be why it took tone number four as long as it did to discern a carrier in the midst of the enemy formation.
Indeed, one recent historian goes so far as to assert that the reason Amari didn't see the carrier initially is because it wasn't operating directly with its escorts. However, this position really isn't sustainable. First, this simply isn't how escorting vessels behave. More important, it is completely unsubstantiated by the American ship records. The most likely explanation continues to be a combination of variable visibility conditions and or haphazard spotting on the part of Amari. At the moment, however, nothing could be done, as Tomonaga was still orbiting the fleet. On board Akagi, Hikocho Masuda was dying to begin recovery operations. But the American B-17s continued loitering overhead, making it impossible. In addition, Akagi now had yet another group of fighters warming up on its deck, a quartet of zeros under Petty Officer First Class Taniguchi Masao. Kaga, having sent aloft Yamaguchi's Shotai at 8.15am, had another trio on deck getting ready as well. Its Shotaicho, Petty Officer First Class Yamamoto Akira, will be flying for the second time this morning. Hiryu was in the same boat, and was at this very moment sending aloft a threesome under Lieutenant Mori Shigeru, who was taking his second shift aloft as well. Meanwhile, on Soryu, preparations to launch the D-4Y reconnaissance plane were well advanced, with the spanking new bomber warming up on the flight deck. At 8.24am, in the midst of these combat air patrol preparations, several ships within the force sighted a submarine periscope smack in the middle of the formation. This was Nautilus, which had been skulking around at periscope depth on an intercept course from the southwest. She had previously spotted Kido Butai at 7.10 a.m., sighting the smoke of bombing and anti-aircraft fire beyond the horizon to the northwest. Her skipper, Lieutenant Commander William Brockman, had promptly changed course to close the target and gone to battle stations. Brockman was rewarded at 7.55 a.m. when he sighted masts on the horizon. However, a sharp-eyed Combat Air Patrol Zero spotted him in return and made a quick strafing run. Brockman took his boat down to 100 feet and continued closing. As he did so, the sounds of Japanese sonar could be heard ahead. At 8am, Nautilus's skipper was pleased to sight four vessels, one of which appeared to be a battleship of the East class, one a light cruiser of the Jinsu class, and the last two apparently cruisers of the Yubari class, all were headed westerly on course 2.50 a.m. at 25 knots. Naturally, Brockman decided to attack the battleship and changed his course to draw ahead of her. However, at this moment, his periscope was again spotted by an alert Japanese aircraft, most likely a Type 95 float plane aloft on anti-submarine patrol. This time, Brockman was greeted not with a strafing, but with a bomb deposited next to his boat. Worse yet, the enemy light cruiser bored in with at least two other escorts, pinging as they came. Despite the risks, though, Brockman boldly remained at periscope depth and continued to work closer to his quarry. Nautilus had, in fact, stumbled onto Kido Butai as it temporarily reversed course westward, bringing it directly toward the American submarine. The battleship he had sighted was most likely Kirishima, now leading the heavies westward after the formation's reversal. The Jinsu-class cruiser was obviously Nagara, while the two Yubari-class cruisers were actually Kagero-class destroyers, their larger forward stacks perhaps being the reason for Brockman's misidentifying them. Interestingly, Kirishima appears to have been well in advance of Nagumo's flattops at this time, because Brockman did not sight any of them. Despite Brockman's boldness, the Japanese knew he was coming. At 8.10am, Nagara dropped five depth charges near the sub, just as Nautilus was getting set up for her final attack run. At 8.17am, six more depth charges came crashing down. Things were getting a bit too hairy for even the gutsy Brockman's tastes, and he eased his boat down to 90 feet to avoid the wary eyes of both the buzzing combat air patrol and the Japanese lookouts. Nagara and her consorts promptly dropped nine more depth charges. Brockman, though, popped back up to periscope depth as soon as the attack ended. Raising his periscope, he recalled that the picture presented was one never experienced in peacetime practices. Ships were on all sides moving across the field at high speed and circling away to avoid the submarine's position. Ranges were above 3,000 yards. The Jinsu-class cruiser had passed over and was now astern.
The battleship was on our port bow and firing her whole starboard broadside battery at the periscope. Brockman, though, was having problems setting up his attack. One of his torpedoes was running hot in its tube, having had its retaining pin sheared away during the depth charging. It was making a hellacious racket, and Brockman was certain that the Japanese escorts could hear its banshee wailing. Nagumo's fleet, what little Brockman could see of it, was still on a westerly heading when Nautilus fired at 8.25am. His target was Kirishima. Taking aim at her starboard side, Brockman let fly with two torpedoes at a range of 4,500 yards. Or at least he thought he did. He found out later that one tube did not fire, leaving only one fish streaking toward the target. Kirishima evaded this threat by executing a sharp turn to port, heading south and directly away from the torpedo. Whether Kirishima even saw Nautilus is open to debate her firing at the sub's periscope may in fact have been directed at a fresh set of American planes that were attacking her about this time. Whatever the reason, though, her neat turn away was exactly what was needed to spoil Brockman's attack. Not only that, but Nagara once again sighted the sub and charged in to renew her attack. Brockman quickly dove to 150 feet, just as another round of depth charging began at 8.30 a.m. As soon as Nautilus's scope was seen on the western edge of the force, Nagumo's carriers made tracks to get away by heading back east. The fact that Nagara's persistent attacks had forced the American boat to dive again was comforting for the Japanese, at least as far as it went. However, the knowledge that an American submarine was lurking near at hand undoubtedly notched the pressure on the Japanese up still further. Not only that, but nearly simultaneous with Nautilus's appearance, yet another American air attack the third in the last 30 minutes began materialising. This was a force of 11 old Marine SB-2U Vindicator Scout Bombers, the second half of Marine Scout Bombing Squadron 241, led by that unit's executive officer, Major Benjamin W. Norris. His aircraft had followed Henderson's flight in at some distance. Captain Aoki, seeing this new threat, at 8.27 a.m. turned Akagi sharply away from the Americans. Fortunately for Akagi, she had just launched fighters, or she would have been sorely beset. As it was, though, these new additions, as well as some of the Zeros that had just beaten off Henderson, were able to assemble in time to deflect this new blow. Akagi's hard-working Lieutenant Ibusuki was present, along with the two sixth coup pilots still in the air, they were joined by Warrant Officer Ono Zenji's trio. Hiryu contributed the two remaining members from her third watch, and Soryu's Lieutenant Fujita and his three-plane Shotai also charged back into the attack. Norris's command, though, benefited from the rather hasty nature of the defence thrown up in front of the force's two flagships. The Americans lost no inbound aircraft this time, though several were badly shot up. Whether by prudence or simply judging that Akagi and Hiryu were too far away to be attacked effectively, Norris decided to focus his efforts on the battleship Haruna. She was on the edge of the main body, and as such was easier to get to. In the face of the battleship's anti-aircraft, they began tilting into their dives. Haruna's skipper, Rear Admiral Takama Tomotsu, wasted no time in demonstrating that he knew how to drive his ship. The big battle wagon slithered through a series of evasive turns, neatly threading the needle between the Vindicator's attacks. Although Haruna was bracketed by five or six near misses, the bombs didn't damage her a whit. At the conclusion of the attack, Kido Butai's Zeros harried the Americans off to the southwest, eventually claiming a pair of dive bombers. The reader is forgiven for being confused by the rather bewildering welter of goings-on at this juncture, but that is precisely the point that needs to be made. The situation was confusing, no less to the contemporary historian trying to pick apart the exact sequence of events ex post facto than to the men standing on Akagi's bridge. The American air attacks, while materially ineffective, were nearly constant. As a result, Kido Butai was having no luck getting into any sort of a rhythm. It was operating reactively. Worse, its various responses, at least in terms of air defence, do not appear to have been centrally coordinated. The rather precipitous drop in combat air patrol assets at around 8am had been followed by something of an overreaction on the part of the individual Hikokos as they stoked the combat air patrol back up.
There does not appear to have been anyone within the force looking down the road and assessing what was really needed. Instead, as the American attacks rolled in, the Japanese responded almost reflexively, sending up Shotai's piecemeal. It's not hard to see how this might have happened. Nagumo was stuck on board a wildly maneuvering carrier, watching his other vessels running pell-mell in all directions. Every time it looked as if things were settling down a bit, another air raid warning would come in. Nagumo can hardly have known where all his ships were at any given time, let alone have had an appreciation of what his aggregate combat air patrol strength was. Here is where the Japanese lack of early warning radar materially damaged their chances in the battle. Radar was like a crystal ball, in effect. It allowed the commander to look a certain distance into the future, see developing threats, and plan accordingly. As it was, though, the combat air patrol battle was being directed by four air officers on four separate ships who could barely communicate with each other or their forces aloft. Without the ability to prognosticate what was pending in the way of attacks, the predictably human response to the question of how much combat air patrol is enough. It was just a little bit more. Lack of radar also reduced the effective distance at which the combat air patrol fighters could engage the Americans. Early warning for the Japanese force was provided by its outlying cruisers and destroyers. Yet these pickets could only be pushed out so far from the force before they, too, would be beyond visual range of the carriers. As a result, the combat air patrol was frequently engaging the Americans fairly close to the Japanese carriers. In many cases, the Zeros pursued fleeing Americans through the midst of the force itself. Not only was this dangerous, but it also meant that in many cases the combat air patrol wasn't being given the space it needed to operate most efficiently. Many of the American attacks would have probably been even more badly chewed up had they been detected farther away. Having radar might not have been a panacea for the Japanese, though. As the Americans could testify, learning to use this new technology was no cakewalk. Effective use of radar had already driven the Americans to make the conceptual leap toward the centralised coordination of air defence assets from many ships via a single location, the Combat Information Centre. The first prototype Combat Information Centre had been installed aboard Hornet when she was commissioned in October 1941. Even later in the war, having had radar on their ships for two years, the Japanese would never manage to make this leap. Above all, effective use of radar required adequate communications to the individual combat air patrol elements. The Japanese, operating as they were on a single radio frequency for all of their aircraft and having faulty radios in their zeros, met neither of these prerequisites. Thus, even if the Japanese had had radar at Midway, its use might have been limited. By around 8.30 a.m., the American attacks were finally starting to wind down, and the Japanese were beginning to think about landing the Midway attack force. Admiral Yamaguchi, however, was probably concerned by having been on the receiving end of an attack by what had appeared to be carrier-type aircraft. Apparently exasperated by the inability to strike back, he had a message flash from Hiryu to Akagi's plane guard destroyer, Nowaki. She, in turn, dutifully relayed the Admiral's message to Nagumo. Consider it advisable to launch attack force immediately. Nagumo's mood upon receiving this entreaty from his brash subordinate has not been recorded, but it hardly could have been charitable. By any rational standard, the time for launching a strike against the Americans was long past, and Yamaguchi should have known it. Indeed, the force was even now scrambling in preparation for bringing Tomonaga down. More important, of course, was the fact that at 8.20am, Nagumo still had no ability to strike immediately. The photographs taken by American B-17s during this interval make it perfectly clear that no strike aircraft were on the Japanese flight decks. Thus, Yamaguchi's entreaty really was tantamount to suggesting that Tomonaga's flight be ditched en masse, in preference for an immediate spotting and subsequent launch at perhaps 9.15 a.m. Coming from a man who had suggested during the planning for Pearl Harbor that the solution to Hiryu's and Soryu's shorter range was to abandon them off the Hawaiian Islands after the completion of the operation, this simply was not a serious proposal. Nagumo didn't even bother replying. At the same time Yamaguchi was venting spleen, Akagi sent aloft Petty Officer First Class Taniguchi's Shotai of Zeros at 8.32am.
Kaga did the same with Petty Officer First Class Yamamoto's threesome. To the rear, Soryu sent up her Type 2 recon aircraft, with explicit orders to find the American task group and send back a definitive position fix. The D-4Y buzzed off to the east, none too soon, as at 8.34am Petty Officer Amari radioed Nagumo that Tone No. 4 was homeward bound. This announcement was not greeted with joy on Akagi, and Amari was told in short order to stay where he was. Besides his admiral's displeasure, Amari was beginning to have difficulties of his own. His fuel was starting to run low. Worse, the Americans were now aware of his presence, having detected him on radar at around 8.15am. On several occasions during the morning, flitting about just above the southern horizon, he was hunted by enemy combat air patrol fighters. Amari's pilot, though, skillfully ducked into clouds when pressed, relatively near at hand to Tone's elusive scout. Frank Jack Fletcher's Yorktown was about to get into the action. Having charged down from the northeast after recovering her search aircraft, she was now within range to launch. Fletcher had hoped that further reports from the PBYs would clarify the enemy situation somewhat during the interim. However, no new information on any additional Japanese carrier groups was forthcoming, and in the end, Fletcher ordered Yorktown to begin launching at 8.38am. Unlike her sister ships, Yorktown managed to launch a well-coordinated strike. She sent up a total of 35 aircraft, six fighters, 17 dive bombers and 12 torpedo planes in two deck loads. The scout bomber Douglases went first, followed by the torpedo bomber Douglas, the latter heading off immediately to the southwest at 2,500 feet. A quick spot and launch then sent up the shorter-ranged Wildcats. The scout bomber Douglases and fighters soon followed after the slower torpedo bomber Douglas. The entire formation was in the air by 1906. Yorktown's second dive bomber squadron was left on board as a reserve, much to the collective disgust of its pilots. Fletcher's plan was fairly simple. He and his staff had mapped out a course to an intercept point, where they expected Nagumo's fleet would be at 9 a.m., they knew they had to allow for the fact that the original Japanese sighting reports were now several hours old. Further, while they were convinced that Nagumo would roughly hold his course, they also assumed that he would not approach Midway too closely. Therefore, Fletcher judged the most likely position of the Japanese carriers to be 30 degrees 0 minutes north, 179 degrees 0 minutes west, which at 9am would place them at a bearing of 240 degrees, 150 miles from Task Force 17. Yorktown's planes would fly a course straight to that point. If they did not spot the enemy, they would turn northwest and fly up the enemy's line of advance, before turning at last for the northeast leg back home. With such an approach, Fletcher's staff believed they would be able to come across the Japanese no matter which way they manoeuvred. It is worthwhile noting the differences between the staff and air operational work aboard Task Force 16 and 17. Whereas Task Force 16's launches had devolved into almost a shotgun approach to the problem, Yorktown's entire group was directed along a single bearing toward a single point on the ocean. This meant that if Yorktown's group found the enemy, it would be in a much better position to deliver a well-coordinated attack. Not only that, but since Task Force 17's departure was almost an hour later, her air group would benefit from changes in weather conditions and visibility as they flew their route. With Yorktown's launch, the Americans now had a total of 151 carrier aircraft in the air. The question was, could they find the Japanese? At the very moment Fletcher was sending the last of his aircraft up, Nagumo was bringing the bulk of his down. Finally, at 8.37am, Akagi hoisted a white flag with a black ball, indicating that her decks were open for business. Underneath the landing ensign were two numeric flags giving the wind velocity in metres per second. Still circling overhead, Tomonaga's force no doubt breathed a collective sigh of relief to see these welcome signals come fluttering up the carrier's yardarms. Now came the tricky part, in the intervening four hours since Tomonaga's launch, Kido Butai had moved farther away from the descending cold front. As the force had travelled southeast, the wind direction had gradually shifted around until it was now coming out of the east-northeast at about three metres, second. 
contrary to most maps of the battle that show Kido Butai steering a southeastern course at this time. It is far more likely that the carriers were now all steering roughly east. This is supported by Akagi's log entries in the Nagumo report and is consistent with a carrier force landing aircraft. Furthermore, we know from the post-war testimony of several of Kido Butai's carrier officers that the carriers moved in unison when performing large takeoff or landing operations. Thus, we can presume that all four carriers were headed roughly east at this time. The other effect that the eastward turn had was to place carrier division 2 Hiryu and Soryu in the lead of the formation. Whereas formerly the two divisional flagships had taken the four, now the fleet had essentially turned on its heels, with each ship turning individually to take up the new heading. Nagumo didn't have time for niceties, now dressing his formation for parade would have to wait. It seems likely, though, that Soryu used her superior speed to catch up to Hiryu somewhat, keeping her divisional flagship off her starboard beam. Thus, Kido Butai's carriers were no longer in a box formation, but were gradually elongating into something of a trapezoid. The position of the escorting heavy units is more difficult to ascertain, and it is probable that they were in various sectors of the formation during different times of the day. However, it seems likely that Battle Division 3 was in column on the port side of the formation, with Haruna in the lead. Likewise, Abe's flagship, Tone, led Chikuma on the starboard side. Nagara was in the centre van, leading the carriers. The positions of many of the Japanese destroyers are almost totally unknown, other than the fact that the majority of them were acting as air raid pickets. The rough whereabouts of Arashi we know about only because she was busy dealing with Nautilus for a portion of the morning. We have consistent evidence that Nawaki was Akagi's plane guard destroyer, and Isakaze was Soryu's. We can presume that Hagikaze was likely acting in the same role for Kaga. But the specific location of the others is unknown, and in the absence of their logs will likely remain so. In truth, they probably varied wildly as the morning's attacks unfolded. Nagara, a squadron flagship for the destroyers, most likely tried to maintain a position at the head of the formation, but it would appear that she may have roamed about as well, particularly in response to Nautilus's earlier attack. Landing an airplane on a carrier is perhaps the most difficult challenge faced by any pilot, and Tomonaga's men had to do it under more stressful circumstances than normal. The morning mission had been a long one, and everyone was hungry and tired, their aircraft were low on fuel, and the landing had to be conducted under the threat of enemy attack. They needed to get down as quickly and precisely as possible. Unfortunately, given the damaged condition of many of the airplanes, just getting them on the deck in one piece was going to be a challenge. Indeed, Fuchida's rather glib statement that with the veteran flyers we had at this time, speedy recovery operations on board the carriers even under stringent battle conditions were little more than child's play is clearly an oversimplification of the situation facing Tomonaga's flyers. His quip both understates the inherent dangers of landing operations and simultaneously heaps further discredit on Nagumo's moaning regarding his pilot's training. In fact, both men were wrong Nagumo's pilots were well trained, but carrier landings were a very delicate business, even for experienced aviators. The aircraft began forming clockwise, holding patterns outboard of their home carriers. Each was readily identifiable by the configuration of their island and deck features, but each also had a large white Kana symbol painted on the flight deck after identification, A for Akagi, Ka for Kaga, Hai for Hiryu, and Sa for Soryu. Planes with mechanical problems or wounded crewmen were moved to the heads of queue. One by one, each plane broke out of the holding circle, crossed the bow of the carrier some ways ahead, and flew down its opposite side. Once behind the ship, each turned inward to line up their final approaches. This took them practically over the top of the carrier's plane guard destroyer, which was stationed 700 to 1,000 metres astern. From there, they could rescue any downed aviators who fell short of the fantail or went over the side. If all was normal, the aircraft would turn in so as to be about 700 metres behind the carrier, at 200 metres altitude. Just as with takeoffs, the decision-making authority for landing was vested almost solely in the pilot. The Imperial Navy had no comparable officer to the United States Navy's landing signal officer. 
No one on board the carrier was charged with actively directing the planes, although a signals Sabian, under the command of the Hikocho, could wave off a plane if it was judged to be in a blatantly unsafe approach or if the deck was fouled. Once in the final approach, the pilot established his glide slope. However, the Japanese also had a unique landing aid, Chakkan Shidoto landing guidance lights, to assist the pilot in setting up a safe approach. Originally, it had been intended for night landing purposes, but it had proven so useful that it was used in daytime as well. This device consisted of a bank of two red lights set at the level of the flight deck and a similar bank of four green lights set some 10 to 15 metres forward. First developed in 1932, each of the one kilowatt lights was variable in intensity and equipped with a mirror so as to emit a very narrow cone of illumination. Matched arrays were located on opposite sides of the ship. The angle of the lights was adjusted for each type of airplane. Attack planes typically came in at around a five-degree slope, fighters perhaps a half-degree steeper than that. As the pilot descended, he attempted to make the lights line up so that the green lights were positioned immediately above the red. If the pilot could only see the red lights, he had fallen out of the cone of green light. He was below the correct slope. If the red lights were over the green, he was coming in so low that he would probably hit the ship's fantail. Likewise, if the green light was positioned far above the red, the pilot was coming in too high. As the plane approached the flight deck, he would eventually lose sight of the rear edge of the flight deck. However, Japanese carriers had white or red and white striped outrigger platforms near the aft end of the flight deck. These platforms helped the pilot gauge the orientation of the flight deck, even if the deck was obscured by the nose of the aircraft. At any point in the approach, the Sabian could signal the pilot as to his condition. A red flag from the Sabian signalled that the pilot should go around again. A white flag with an H meant that the aircraft's hook was not lowered. Each pilot aimed to keep his airspeed about 10 knots above stalling. For most aircraft, this meant maintaining between 70 and 75 knots, lining up the final few seconds of the approach required excellent reflexes. In any sort of a crosswind, even a second's worth of inattention could mean putting the plane over the side and into the heavy steel netting that lined the flight deck. But if everything went properly, the pilot would cut his engine just before reaching the brightly painted fantail and then catch one of the arresting wires with his hook. Snagging the arresting wire was hardly a restful way to come to a halt, but it was not nearly as violent as the deceleration found on a post-war carrier jet. The Cura Type 4 arresting gear used at Midway had an induction coil drum below the flight deck, around which the arresting wires were spoiled. The wires were held about eight inches off the deck, by a support that could be lowered flat when not in use. Type 4 could stop a four-ton aircraft travelling at a speed of 60 knots in less than 40 metres, applying about two G-forces of deceleration in the process. As the first aircraft began approaching, the deck crewmen crouched in their tubs alongside the flight deck. This was where things could get really exciting. Landing accidents were not uncommon even under peacetime conditions, and with damaged aircraft and wounded pilots, the odds were good that somebody was going to crack up this morning. The most common mishap was the pilot missing the deck astern, damaged landing gear from hard landings, hitting the island with a wing, and going over the side were not unheard of either. Another common accident was a barrier crash, wherein a plane would miss the landing wire and go hurtling into the crash barrier. Like the Americans, the Japanese used barriers to separate the after end of the flight deck, where landings were taking place from the forward portion. If aircraft were parked forward, there would almost certainly be one or more barriers in place between them and the fantail, because a crash into a group of parked aircraft could have disastrous consequences. A typical crash barrier consisted of three athwartships, steel cables, upper, middle and lower, spanning the width of the flight deck. These were supported by poles that could be raised or lowered by compressed air in a matter of a few seconds. Such a barrier could stop a four-ton aircraft travelling at a speed of 50 feet per second in a distance of less than 25 feet. Obviously, hitting the barrier at 4G forces was hardly a love pat, and it often led to unpleasant consequences for the plane and pilot. Still, it was better than ploughing into one's squadron mates. As the planes came down, the deck crew prepared to receive them.
Men with fire extinguishers were standing by, and any damaged plane could be swarmed almost instantly by dozens of rescuers. Japanese records do not record how many deck accidents occurred during the Tomonaga Force's landings, but there must have been some. According to Fuchida, a Kanko is known to have landed on one wheel on board Hiryu, which would have left the plane out of commission for certain, and a mortally wounded fighter pilot from Kaga, Petty Officer First Class Tanaka Yukuo, most likely crash-landed his as well. He died before he could be removed from the cockpit. Most of Tomonaga's men, however, landed successfully. The Japanese were certainly aided by the easy landing characteristics of their carrier aircraft, which had low stall speeds and forgiving handling. Not surprisingly, the Zero retained its responsiveness even at low speeds, but even the lumbering Type 97, in the opinion of one British test pilot who later flew it, had a docile stall, and thus could be flown to its manoeuvre limits with impunity. All three aircraft also had good visibility over the nose, making control of the plane during the final approach much easier. As soon as each plane had been brought to a halt, deck crewmen rushed out to begin the stowage process. The pilot, or in the case of the Kanko and Kanbaku, the observer would already be releasing the hook, and the crash barriers would be lowered on command from the Hikocho. By now, the deck crew had reached the plane and begun folding its wings. Time was of the essence. Already the next plane would be moving into position to land. The entire final approach, from the time of turn-in to landing on the deck, had taken about 20 seconds so far, and further time was needed to move the plane forward off of the arresting wires. During normal operations, the Japanese were able to land a plane every 25 to 45 seconds. As mentioned earlier, the Japanese avoided deck parks whenever possible. They believed that the hangar afforded more protection to the plane and crew. During landing, the Japanese shoved the newly landed aircraft forward of the crash barrier in preparation for taking the next one on board. Then, as soon as landing operations were completed, all planes were stowed below. It is likely that aircraft whose hangar locations were ahead of the barrier, such as fighters, were simply wheeled forward and stowed below immediately. However, for the Kanko in particular, whose typical storage spots were in the rear of the hangars, striking below had to wait until all aircraft were recovered. This technique, called Renzoku Shuyo, continuous recovery of temporary deck parks and immediate stowage, had been a feature of Japanese carrier operations since the mid-1930s. However, this fixation on hangars had a definite downside, in that the stowage process was governed by elevator cycles. This necessarily retarded Japanese carrier flight operations in comparison to those of their American opposites, who in general performed most refueling and rearming functions right on the flight deck. Not only did this restrict the flexibility of Japanese flight operations, but it also restricted the Japanese to performing dangerous rearming procedures within the confines of the ship. The practical consequences of this approach would become apparent in about an hour and a half. As Akagi's aircraft now came on board, the talk on her bridge was all about what to do after landing operations were completed. Nagumo had already sent word out at 8.30am that the force's dive bombers should equip themselves with 250 kg semi-armor-piercing bombs. Having committed to dispatching the enemy task force, Nagumo chose to close with the enemy, so as to ensure that Kido Butai's strike would be within range when his strike was prepared. Nagumo's decision may have also been informed by the desire to keep the wind on his bow. A northeastern course would allow him to conduct flight operations without breaking away from the enemy. At 8.45 a.m., Tone No. 4 sent a new report. Sight what appears to be two additional enemy cruisers in position bearing 8 degrees, distance 250 miles from Midway. Nagumo apparently did not apprehend the true nature of this signal Amari had sighted the fringes of a second American carrier group. Tona No. 4 did not know it, but they were observing Task Force 17. Coincidentally, at the same time that Amari's signal came in, Admiral Abe on board Tone signalled Captain Kimura of Chikuma to send another Type Zero recon floatplane to Amari's position. It was clear that Amari was not sending information along quickly enough. At 8.50 a.m. tone number four again repeated that he was homeward bound, only to be told at 8.54 a.m. that not only was he to stay where he was, 
but he was to activate his radio transmitter and keep it on so that the fleet could home in on him for direction-finding purposes. What Amari thought of this order cannot be known, but it should have been apparent that Nagumo wasn't pleased with his performance thus far. The fact that he was now being expected to broadcast his position, which the Americans could pick up just as easily as his compatriots, could not have been a welcome order. However, he quickly acknowledged its receipt at 8.55am and added that ten enemy torpedo aircraft Yorktown's newly launched strike force were headed toward Kido Butai at 8.55am. Nagumo finally decided to apprise Admiral Yamamoto of the situation he had been grappling with for the last hour and a half, signalling enemy composed of one carrier, five cruisers and five destroyers, sighted at 8am in positions bearing 10 degrees, distance 240 miles from Midway. We are heading for it, by any measure. This was a very sparse communique regarding the current situation. It made no mention of what Kido Butai had been doing since the sighting, nor of Amari's recent report hinting at additional enemy vessels. In fact, though Nagumo could not know it, Yamamoto was already well aware of the presence of the enemy, having intercepted a number of the previous transmissions between Tone No. 4 and Kido Butai. Incredibly, the unexpected presence of the American carrier apparently did not disturb Yamamoto and his staff in the slightest. Captain Kuroshima asked if they should order Nagumo to attack the Americans, but almost immediately vacillated by reminding the commander-in-chief that Nagumo was to have kept half of his aircraft in reserve for just such a contingency. Yamamoto let the matter drop. His leadership at this moment was nothing short of nonchalant, a far cry from the heavy-handed rigidity he had shown a mere two months earlier. At the same time, Nagumo was sending his situation report, Cruiser Chikuma was recovering two of her search planes. It was standard operating procedure for the planes to land in the wake of their mothership, so as to receive the benefit of the relatively calm water there. As soon as they set down, the cruiser would execute a 90-degree turn, usually through the wind, so as to create an area of stiller water on the lee side of her hull. The plane would then taxi up to the ship to be winched on board by the ship's crane. At 8.55 a.m., Chikuma was dead in the water and recovered her aircraft. This made her vulnerable to submarine attack, but there was no other practical way of retrieving her planes. By 9.02 a.m., having recovered a Type 95 and a Type 0, she began working herself back up to rejoin the formation. Submarine attack was a very real possibility, as Kido Butai's old nemesis, Nautilus, was still in the neighbourhood. With Kido Butai's carriers more or less holding their respective courses during landing operations, Lieutenant Commander Brockman picked this inopportune moment to put in a third appearance. Poking his periscope up at 8.46am, he saw that his original group of ships and the target battleship were all well out of range, except for the Jinsu-type cruiser, whose echo ranging was still quite accurate. Nautilus headed back down for a bit. Then at 9am, Brockman raised scope again, and was thrilled to sight a Soryu-class carrier off his starboard bow, heading east at 25 knots, some 16,000 yards distant. She was apparently undamaged, but was firing her anti-aircraft guns at something and changing course continuously. Brockman was on a converging course, but once again Nagara ruined his approach. Brockman noted that while making this observation of the carrier, the Jinsu-type cruiser began to close again at high speed. Admiral Kimura was handling his flagship with dash and aggressiveness. This time Brockman resolved to go after the pesky cruiser instead of firing a single torpedo at the zigzagging target at 9.10am. The range was close, just 2,600 yards, but Nagara changed course, the torpedo missed, and Brockman had no choice but to go deep as quickly as possible. He rigged for depth charging and didn't have long to wait, as the Japanese shortly dropped a brace of six of them on his boat followed by another eight over the next twenty minutes. Interestingly, if Nagara noticed the fish being fired at her, she did not report it. One of her consorts, though, the destroyer Arashi, noted receiving the attack, indicating that she must have been in proximity to Nagara at the time. In any case, either on his own initiative, or perhaps as ordered by Nagara, Commander Watanabe Yasamusa of Arashi decided to remain behind and pin Nautilus down.
The Japanese probably didn't know that thus far they had had three visits from the same submarine, but the fact remained that there had been too many of them poking their noses out this morning. It was time to let Kido Butai get far enough ahead of this one that it wouldn't be a problem anymore. Throughout these happenings, the carriers were still bringing down strike aircraft. The landing process had not proceeded in a uniform fashion across the fleet. Kaga recovered all of her aircraft by 8.50 a.m. Hiryu had apparently not yet even begun recovering hers by that time, for reasons unknown. Akagi completed recovery at 8.59 a.m., some 22 minutes after she began. The carriers of Carrier Division 2 both completed their landings by 9.10 a.m. Immediately thereafter, Akagi recovered a lone combat air patrol fighter, and Kaga brought down five more of her own zeros from her third watch. Once landing operations were complete, the deck crews lost no time moving the strike aircraft below to the hangars. Many of the flight crews had already made their way to their ready rooms for debriefing. This would be the first chance that the ship's officers had to get a detailed picture of what had occurred over Midway more than two hours earlier. Yet the normal debriefings apparently did not take place immediately. Everyone was too busy with preparations for the coming strike. This was unfortunate, because some valuable information could have been learned from the returning airmen, particularly regarding the defensive firepower of the Americans. For one thing, it would have helped explain why there were so many faces missing in the ready rooms of Carrier Division 2, 